You know, the other day, Pam and I were reading Psalm 46, and I got to verse 9 and 10, and listen to this. God makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. Oh, doesn't that sound good right now? And then verse 10, it said, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. God says, I will be exalted in the earth. We need that right now. That's the antidote to all the war and the the turbulent crisis in humanity. It's God being exalted. Father, we just thank you right now. We invite you as the children of God to be exalted here on this earth. That's the remedy. That's the antidote to all of the pain, the suffering, the disease, and the wars. You being exalted because you make the wars to cease. And not just among us, but you make the war to cease in our own hearts and minds when we're troubled and we're fearful. So we invite you to be exalted. And right now we're going to do our part and we're going to be still and know that you are God. Help us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Isn't that so good that we can ask the Lord to help us even to be still and to unfold the promises, the promises and the word of God in our life. We're talking about the kingdom way and this is so exciting. I love this subject because it's the thing where Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. God empowers us to appropriate the benefits of the king's kingdom. Praise God. Let's answer those three big questions again regarding the kingdom way. Number one, what is it? What is the kingdom way? Number two, secondly, why is it so important to you and I? And thirdly, how do we go about going the kingdom way? How do we do it? How? Somebody answer me. How do we do the kingdom of God? How do we go that way? That's what we dial in on today. The big how. Basically, we've been learning that the kingdom way is God's way of doing things and being right. Where there is no way. God's way where there is no way. And yes, you should be asking, well, what's in it for me? Well, that's not very spiritual, Pastor Stephen. Have you ever taken a full-time job but refused the paycheck because, well, I don't want to be self-centered. Well, that might seem noble until you have to feed your children or pay the rent, right? Have you ever gone to the doctor and had her give you medicine and you say, well, no thanks, doctor. I I, I don't want it to be all about me. Well, of course not. That's silly. Have you ever gone to a restaurant and told the waitress, look, nothing for me, but would you just please serve all these people in the dining room? You probably haven't done that. That sounds like a nice thing to do, but you probably haven't done that. So why on earth and before heaven would you diminish God's character and power by thinking it's humility to step away from the source of all life and goodness and not be asking what you know you want an answer to? What's in this whole kingdom way for me, Jesus? What's in it for me? In part two, we read this parable that Jesus told in Matthew 13, verse 44. Let's listen to it again. The kingdom of heaven is like something precious buried in a field, which a man found and he hid it again. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all he has and buys that particular field. The owner of the field gets the treasure. You see, the owner of the context gets the blessing. We talked about how God's will is intrinsically connected to God's way. And yet people, even Christians, think they can legally dissect the two. You can't do it. You can't separate faith from love. You can't separate the blessing of God from the context of his way. So quit frustrating yourself and God. You know, the disciples, they get in a full-on fight, an argument at the Last Supper in Luke chapter 22 about who was going to be the greatest. They get in just a knockdown fight about it. Jesus, he didn't even rebuke them either. You know what he said? He didn't say, how dare you guys want to be, how, I can't believe you guys want to be great, and I, or how dare you guys want to be blessed. As I'm going to the cross, how dare you? He didn't say that. No, and this was right after communion, a holy time. Instead, you know what Jesus did? He seized the opportunity of them wanting to be the greatest, and he actually teaches them how to be the greatest, how to be blessed. He says this, he said, if you want to be the greatest, guys, then you got to learn to do things my way. You got to learn to imitate me. You got to learn to do things the kingdom way. 
Then Jesus proceeded to talk about conferring the kingdom way onto them with great authority. He wanted to not only give them the car, but give them the keys to drive the car. So again, what is the kingdom way that we're seeking, we're supposed to seek first? And why is it so important to you? Look at Romans chapter 14, verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. We call that consuming. It's not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy all in the Holy Spirit. Imagine sitting in a dining room on the great Titanic when the report comes, the ship is sinking. Now at that point, does the quality of your, re your meal really matter? Is your food and drink really that important at that point? I don't think so. You're facing the very real possibility of death in the next few minutes. Does your wealth matter in that moment? Your politics, your job title, which crowd accepts you and which crowd rejects you? Really, do your opinions and preferences in that moment still matter as much as they used to? That you've got to have it your way? It's all about your way? Every man-made system, every man-made government is really like the doomed Titanic. It's all going down, folks. Like Jesus said, you can build on the sand or you can build on the rock. You can build on the temporary or you can build on the eternal. What's doomed to fail or what will stand forever. See, worldly systems tend to deal with the externals, the outward realities. Romans 14 tells us that God's system isn't the temporary, fragile, eat-and-drink, consumer-based system. You know, there was a movie a few years ago, or I guess it was quite a few years ago now, where this family is having this big crisis, and it's a big family disagreement, and they're, they're kind of going back and forth. And finally, the Greek mother, she says to her daughter in desperation, she says, just, just eat something, just eat something, will you? See, are you sad? Eat something. Are you without peace? Well, you know, consume something, buy something, get in the retail. Are you unhappy? Well, get this, get that. See, it's a consumer design system that fails because God's designed you to be fulfilled from the inside out, not from the outside in. God's system, his kingdom way always moves from the inside out, not from the outside in. See, that's consumerism. You can't make life right by fixing the outside, hoping that you're going to feel right on the inside. You can't calm the outside and think you're suddenly going to have peace on the inside. Look, you still won't be able to sleep. Joy is not the product of an external event or the right possessions. It's an outcome of God's abiding presence that fills you from the inside out, not the outside in. Look at John. Jesus is talking in John chapter 7, verse 38. He says this, He who believes in me, Jesus says, as the scripture has said, from his innermost being shall flow springs and rivers of living water. See, true life moves from the inside out. Movement this way is essential. Oh, you see, you see now, we're, we're beginning to hit on the how to seek first the kingdom way, believing on Jesus, but not the, the way that you think he should be believed on. Notice, quote, it said, as the scripture has said. That's what Jesus said, as the scripture has said. See, it's the king's way that produces the results of being in the kingdom of God on the king way. Stephen, that's what I want. Well, good. We're, we're, we're sinking up here. Let's move forward applying this truth practically now. Let's get practical. Because in review, we know the kingdom of God is God's way of doing things and being right. Okay? Have you ever tried to take something out of the oven that's maybe 400 degrees without oven mitts on? Please. Don't ever try to do that. That would be awful. I hope you haven't tried to do that. You put your hands first in oven mitts because it helps you do something that otherwise is physically impossible, right? Something that you can't do without the mitts on. You can't grab just the hot stuff, the hot good food blessing without the mitts. You and I need to be in the Holy Spirit and he and us to go the kingdom way. Romans 14, 17, right? Not consuming, but rightness, peace, and joy. How? In the Holy Spirit. See, the blessings of God are so spiritually hot and good that they require God's help to receive. 
This is how we walk in the kingdom way. We need God's word and his Holy Spirit to help us. We have no righteousness or rightness of our own. We have no oven mitts of our own, none. We need Christ to apply the gloves, the spiritual oven mitts. If you grab the pan instead of the handle, guess what happens? It's too hot. You get burned. Peace. We need Jesus' peace. The Holy Spirit helps us receive and retain Jesus' benefits, his peace. Philippians 4 verse 7 says, the peace of God shall guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus. See, those are oven mitts. The world has pretend peace, but it's cold. It's worthless. Jesus has the real thing. He is the Prince of Peace after all. We need Jesus' joy. Otherwise, you're just faking it. You're faking life. He's the true source of joy. Are you in or are you out? Romans 14, 17 again. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, not consuming from the outside in, but the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. See, it doesn't matter how much stuff you pull toward you or consume. You're out until you're in. Our thinking is naturally twisted. If I can just grab, take, consume, pull everything I want in, every experience, then I'll be in. No, no, you you won't. You won't. That's why you're at the age you're at and you still feel like you're on the outside looking in. No matter how much you've taken in, no matter how much you've experienced, you'll just be one more lost soul wanting to be in but dying out. Romans 14, 17, it's the secret code to being in. It says the kingdom way is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, not based on outward circumstances, but rather based on what God imparts by his word and Holy Spirit. This inner good reality becomes your outer great reality. So how does God shape your inner reality to design your external reality, your external experiences? You see, this is not such a strange phenomenon at all. This, is, this isn't really that strange to you. The unseen becoming the seen. Is it that strange? The invisible becoming the visible. The unseen beginning of a seed in an egg becoming a beautiful baby, becoming a full-grown man or a full-grown woman. The unseen imagination of an architect becoming a blueprint, becoming a building. The unheard inspiration of a songwriter becoming a lyric, maybe becoming a recorded hit song. The God-inspired compassion of precious Mother Teresa helping one life and in doing so, touching millions of lives. And on the other hand, it works the other way too. The evil imagination of a hate-controlled heart becoming a murder, a terrorist. You are made in the image of God. That means you have this strong inherent power where your inner reality becomes an outer manifestation. The problem is you and I were born in sin. That doesn't translate into good crops, good reality. We need help, forgiveness, redemption to change and transform the destiny of that reality. All of us need saving. We need help because sin brings forth death. Romans 3, verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Well, what's the glory of God? What's the big deal? God's great plan for you. That's the big deal. His dominion, his authority position in his kingdom. Remember, in the kingdom of God are all the benefits of God, the will of God, moving from the inside to the outside, from the unseen to the seen. An unborn baby moves from the inside of the womb to the outside. You can never receive what God has for you if you're seeking first what's on the outside. You become disrespectful of the seed, of the invisible. You must be able to operate according to the kingdom way to receive what God has for you. Oh, I love that. Oh, my friend, this is so important. This is how, from the invisible seed to the visible harvest. One day, a mom was singing a song over and over and over, and her three-year-old heard her, and, and she said, Mom, you must like that song. You, Mommy, you must like that song. The mom replied, Oh, not really, dear. The stupid song's just stuck in my head. The little girl, she turned to her mother, and she began just kind of putting her fingers through her hair, and she goes, Mom, I, I, I don't see anything stuck in your head, Mommy. So cute, a little girl's understanding. But listen, we can get good or bad things stuck on the inside of us. 
What's steering your reality? What seed is steering your future? The enemy of your soul works so hard to get bad things stuck on the inside of you because he knows the inherent power of your design. But you see, good things have to be pursued. It's like the salmon swimming up river. You gotta pursue the good things. You have to choose the good stuff. Just like a piece of ground has to be intentionally sown with good grass, otherwise weeds just automatically grow. Look, you have to choose the good stuff. It's not automatic in this broken world order. Weeds are automatic, not good grass. I'm not saying your outer reality is not important. I'm saying it's directed by your inner reality. The invisible steers the visible. There are three approaches to your outer reality life. One, passive, two, ignorant, and three, active. Number one, the passive approach is, it'll just all work out. What will be, will be. Que sera, sera. This must be God's will, or, or just whatever. I'll do, I'll do better starting tomorrow, maybe. We'll see. Who cares? Number two, the ignorant approach is, well, I don't know. I, I, I can't choose. I don't have. It's not my fault. No one told me. It's not my responsibility. If only this and if only that. Who knows what, who knows what God's going to do? You know, I'm praying 24-7. Who knows what God's going to do? And number three, the active approach. I'm aligning my thinking with God's thinking right now. I'm getting help right now. I'll take full responsibility. Here's what I want. So these are the seeds that I need to sow. God, direct me to obey you. If I'm going to walk the kingdom way, then I need to know the kingdom way. I need to know it. I know your answer in response to these three choices. You're a wise person, so you want to take the active approach to God's kingdom way. The how. So let's get pragmatic then about intentionally having your inner reality decide your outer reality. Here is a step-by-step -step simple guide on how to live the kingdom way. Step number one, you make Jesus the Lord of your life, the king of your heart. That means only he sits on the throne of your heart, not you, not this, not that, not them. That means Jesus calls all the shots from the inside out. You consult him, his word. All other directors, dictators, opinions, and feelings are permanently, guess what, off the throne. Yes, even the entertainment world and the government, if they say killing unborn babies is civilized, you choose rather to believe on Jesus and stand for morality with your vote, with your dollars, with your decisions, everything. If academia and a thousand PhDs tells you that they know better how to raise your child, you still believe that Jesus prioritizes your family and he knows better how to keep them from all the craziness. You perceive and acknowledge Jesus on the throne of every choice, decision, and turn in life. That's what making Jesus Lord of your life means. Now, step two, you learn the language of God's kingdom. You got to know the language. It's faith. That's the kingdom way. So how can you take direction from a king if you don't know his language? That makes sense. Shared understanding is knowing God understands you but you need to understand him. Faith is the language of God and faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's in Romans 10, verse 17. Faith, this unseen force of God is the substance. It's the title deed to the revealed, the promises, the blessings, the outcome. And you've heard me say this many times, repetition determines your persuasion. Repetition determines your persuasion. That becomes your faith, whether for good or for bad. Now, step three, you got to work patience and expectation over and over and over. You must let patience have her perfect work, James 1, 4 says. It's part of growing you up and then you're lacking nothing and a, your, your patience becomes a prerequisite to you lacking nothing and being fully equipped. You must exercise expectation in God because it pleases God. That's what Hebrews eleven six 6 says. Without faith, it's impossible to please God for he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he's the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Look, it's not enough just to believe God is, you must discover and learn that he is your rewarder. When you please him, that pleases him that you just expect of him. That requires working patience into expectations, seeing it fulfilled because it pleases God. And then step four, finishing all the way around the clock, God honors you. God the Father didn't put Jesus on the throne of your heart not to 
honor you. You are called to be a child of God. That's royalty, but you must be trained for kingdom of God living. The reward of humility and the worship of God is, guess what? Riches, honor, and life. You can see that in Proverbs 22, verse 4. Jesus scolded the religious leaders because they didn't want the honor that only comes from God. No, no. They were content for fake honor that comes from men. You can read that in John 5, verse 44. When God the Father says, well done, it is an amazing honor reverberating throughout heaven. Jesus said in John 12, verse 26, that when we obey Jesus, Father God is honored. God honors us with answered prayers, blessings, forgiveness, peace, joy, health, answers. That's an honor. God showing up when we worship him, that's an honor. His presence in your room is an extreme honor. So let's try now putting this step-by-step -step guide to work on how to live the kingdom way. So pretend you're a vehicle. You, you're a vehicle, a vessel designed to go somewhere. You, you're designed with a destiny. Does that sound a little bit good to you now? Is that simple enough for you picking up on that? Now let's use our step-by-step -step guide to work the kingdom way. Step number one, remember you're a vehicle. You make Jesus the Lord of your life. In other words, he steers and works the controls. Step number two, you respond to the language of the kingdom. You respond to his steering. That's the language. Step number three, you as a vehicle, you need to practice patience and expectation. You're going someplace, so you're going to have to stay steady and keep on going. Don't stop. And step number four, God honors you because you get to your destiny. You arrive. Yay for you. Well done. You get to the destination. Look, the two top prayer requests that people make are for financial help and for healing. So let's ap apply these same steps to these prayers, to these needs, these requests. All right. Step one, you make Jesus the Lord of your life. So now you're under the king's influence and leading with regard to your financial situation or your need for healing. He steers you. That's step number one. Step two, you respond to the language of the kingdom. You begin to think and say what the king says about your finances or regarding your total healing. After all, communication requires alignment. Isn't that correct? You can't work at McDonald's, for example, and call a quarter pounder a whopper. 1 Peter 2, 24, this is what the word says. The kingdom says, by Jesus' stripes, you've been healed. By um, Philippians 4, verse 19 says, my God will liberally supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. You see, the kingdom requires its citizens to speak the language of the kingdom. That's faith. What you feel is very different than what you faith, but trusting in God is the kingdom way. You may feel like a whopper, but you're working at McDonald's, so speak the language or you're going to lose your job. Step number three, patience and expectation. You stay steady on the kingdom way. You don't exit. Stay moving forward. Don't shift your trust away from God and put it on the latest cultural guidance. Galatians 6 verse 9 says this, Let us not grow weary or become discouraged in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap if we don't give in. The kingdom way leads to reaping, so keep on going, my friend. The true path is not a wishing well or a genie in a bottle arrangement. It's not a lottery. It's God's guidance and way of doing things. God uses the law of reciprocity, sowing and reaping. Jesus often used parables about seeds sown and plants grown to describe the kingdom of God. When he spoke to investors, guess what? He used parables about commodities and investments. As I've said, the kingdom of God is not a religious system. It's the kingdom of God system run by the king of all kings. So think about a very simple, common, practical application of patience and expectations. Parents, Parents don't feel love when their kid is acting like a total brat. They don't feel the love, but they rely on patience and persistence to see the expectation of their love investment. They go beyond feelings. They stay on the road of doing good because it's all about that precious child's destiny, their child's destiny. So step number three of our guidance in getting our prayers answered is patience and expectation. Keep going. Don't stop. Don't give up. Don't give in. And then step four, God honors you. 
You see, when God forgives our sins, he honors us. When he gives us his family name, that's such an honor. When God heals our bodies, our minds, gives us peace, restores our marriages, he gives us joy, he honors us. When God provides a job, an assignment, good community relationships, when he provides another meal to eat, oh my goodness, God honors us. James 1.17 says this, that every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights in whom there's no variableness or shadow of turning. Well, Pastor Stephen, why do so many Christians seem to go through life without God's honor? Dreams unfulfilled, prayers that just don't seem to get answered. They're unhappy. They're without peace. Did God fail? Look, if steps one, two, three, and four were instruction for making a cake, would it work would it work out if you just did step four? If the sequence of steps was, let's say, your four-digit pin at your bank, would the ATM work if you only put in two of the steps? Knowing what and why are top priority. But if you don't know the how, it's all just theory. It never gets practical. There's a difference between receiving the king and walking in or applying the king's way. Oh, Pastor Stephen, Jesus, save me from the storms of life. I, I don't expect anything more. I'll just wander around here in the desert and be thankful. What? And that honors God how? Jesus saved you from the dark waters of sin, but saved you for the kingdom way. Well, if God wants me on the kingdom way, he'll just put me there. Where is that in the book? Where is that in the Bible? Jesus made a way for you where there is no way. Honor him now by getting on the way. Start with step number one and give your life to Jesus. Only you can give you to Christ. Pray this with me. Dear Lord Jesus, I need all of you. I need all you have for me. You are the way. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. In my life, forgive me of all my sins. You died on the cross for me, rose up from the grave. Take your place on the throne of my heart. Be the Lord of all my decisions. Give me every kingdom benefit. In your name, Jesus, amen.